I'm an actuary. Yeah. Huh. What about you? Uh, I have tested directly in the center of the spectrum. Oh, interesting. Every time in my life, I've been a little bit over here and a little bit over there. Right. So go extrovert for a while, and then I've run out of juice, and I have to go be an introvert for right. a few days. Right. <laughs> right. It's so restock. Yeah. By yourself. Yeah. Uh, I could talk to people. I can do this show. I was in sales for a while. So it's mm. <laughs> not, a, not a shrinking violence. You have that side. <laughs> yeah. You have that side. Right. But a uh, nice afternoon, just being a manuscript. Oh, that's heaven. Yeah. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. I've always been a reader too. And that is obviously, we think of that as being a more introverted um, thing. And I mean, I think it is. It's you in the book, you know? So, well, I mean, if you, I don't know, join a book club or run out and talk to the people yeah, that uh, talk to people you just read their book. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess I do think the experience of reading is really a, so, you know, that's a solitary thing. You and the story, you and the characters together. Mm-hmm. Although maybe it is like talking with the characters and being with people in that way. I don't know. I've never thought about that before. <laughs> They're like middle grade books, uh, especially if you're reading to students or you're just present while it's being read to students. That's very much a communal activity. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Uh, that's... Totally different experience. I especially appreciated it when I was a kid and I knew I wasn't reading it quite the way it was meant to be read. So if I had some adult who understood a little mm-hmm. more reading it mm-hmm. correctly, especially if it was a book I'd already read and then I could hear them read it like, oh, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. Now. Yeah. I, um, I also have very fond memories of having a librarian read aloud to, um, I went to a new school starting in fifth grade. I went to a fifth to eighth grade school and um, the librarian read out loud to us all, all through the whole time up through eighth grade. And I loved that. And when I was a librarian for a brief, very brief period, I also, I read out loud a lot. I love, I loved it so much as a kid. I wanted to do that for the kids. You know, it's just a great, I love it. Well, I feel like this should just be the start of the show because uh, we, yeah. we started right at that. Uh, already right in there. <laughs> let's do this. Yeah. Um, so I know at what, 13, you got your first job in a bookstore at the Cheshire Cat. Is that right? True. True. That's right. My, my, <laughs> if, it's funny because you, you know, Rob, you had sent, um, a list of some of the questions that you might ask, you know, and you would let me know that we'd, we'd probably start here with like a little bit about the background. And I was thinking so many of my friends, we have a joke, whenever you ask a question, you, we all have to begin with like, well, first I was born then, <laughs> but so I'm not going quite that far back, but as you point out, I'm going to go back to age 13. Um, uh, but just briefly there and then moving much more quickly to, um, to something a little more current than, than me being 13. But yeah, I grew up in a neighborhood in Washington, D.C., where there's one of the first children's only bookstores in the country. This was in the this would have been in the 70s, the late 70s, uh, I think, or the early 80s. Anyway, um, Cheshire Cat Bookstore. And so I worked there. I had a little job there after school stocking the shelves. Um, and then, you know, fast forward many years to graduation from college. And I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, found myself working in a Borders um, bookstore. And then I saw a lot of authors came through that Borders on book tour. And I thought, and they would come with their publicists from New York. And it just looked very exciting. And the publicists were always like these sharply dressed people. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's, I need to get to New York and do that. So I had friends living in New York. I moved to New York and I moved in with them got a job in publishing and worked, and then eventually worked my way into um, children's books um, and doing marketing for children's books. Um, And loved that for many years. Then I started to think I wanted to find a way to get a little bit closer to the book. You know, marketing, you are coming in kind of at the end of the process. The book is already acquired and edited and ready to go. And I had always been, my whole life, a very passionate reader. That's why I got the job at the Cheshire Cat um, in the first place, because they knew me as a as a kid who would come to shop there. Um, and um, so I left um, publishing, got a degree in library science, 
worked in libraries for a couple of years. I worked at a branch of the Brooklyn Public Library and in a girls um, school. <clears throat> and then I went back to Penguin where I had been for a while and was the library marketing director. Um, during that time, I sort of took on two hats and acquired just a few projects at Dutton Children's Books. So I was sort of doing, I still was the library director, but I was also acquiring a couple projects and working with the publisher of Dutton Books at that time. And then, um, and then I moved over to Holt. Um, Henry Holt Books for Young Readers, where I was managing the whole marketing department, so overseeing library marketing, but also um, trade and publicity and online and the whole the whole group. And then um, Holt was a smaller publisher, so it was not vastly more people that I was managing, but all the channels. And then um, and then I had my two kids, and I was thinking it was time for a change. Um, and um, I had had in the back of my head for a long time, agenting could be um, a really good fit for me. And what I love about it, and so now I've been agenting for, I think just over 10 years. And what I love about it is um, that you get to wear so many different hats. Um, there's a little bit of sales, there's a little bit of marketing, there's editing, there's just uh, letting me indulge who I am as a reader. Um, it's working very closely with creative people, which I love. Um, so lots of things about it that I love, but I feel like it, it is, it is the perfect way to put all those, you know, a little bit of libraries some bookstores, some publishing, it kind of all those things come into it really nicely. I feel like, so that's well, a bit about me. The, the story of your birth, so I want to make sure we got my dog teasing. Uh, <laughs> you missed a part uh, there. So I, I, I'm assuming Cheshire Books isn't just hiring every 13 year old they see. Um, <laughs> they, they must have made a special exception for you. Well, you, you know what? Actually, they so it was such a special place. It really, it really was such a special place. The Cheshire Cat Bookstore was opened by a a group of women who were they had all worked together at a really lovely school in Washington, DC. It was, it's a private, I don't know what, I can't remember what it was. It was a private school. And some of them had been classroom teachers and two of them were librarians for the school. And so they, they, they were the core group of the women who ran the store and they, they hired, they always hired, um, junior high school and high school students to, to restock the shelves because they had always worked with kids and they knew kids and they loved kids. And that's why they wanted to open a children's only bookstore. I literally lived two, bo two blocks from the store and my orthodontist was upstairs. So for years before I was hired, I would go to the orthodontist and then I would go to Baskin Robbins, which was two doors down. And then I would go to the bookstore. And that was like my pick me up after going to the orthodontist, I would go have an ice cream and buy a new book. But I remember waiting, even before that, I remember waiting online for a book signing with Judy Bloom online that wrapped all around the block. I remember seeing um, Daniel Pinkwater there. Like I, I, I grew up in that store. So they did know me. It wasn't like totally random that, that they hired me um, at that store. This is a special place. A really special place. So you're obviously a, a book enthusiast uh, from a young oh, age. Totally. Uh, did you ever think about maybe you wanted to be a writer, or what was it about publicists specifically that said, "Oh, that's that that's the way." That, oh, that's the way for me. I think that was a 21 year old brain that thought publicist. Honestly, it seemed glamorous. <laughs> that's what, that's what I that's what that was about. Um, I, you know, I then later did do some publicity. Um, I never was a full publicist but you you know in marketing sometimes you wear a couple different hats and publicity that is a hard job and I would not be a great publicist actually um but um which doesn't mean I can't you know send out great cheer for my clients books but um the real work of being a real publicist is is that's hard um but anyway um I um I forgot what your question was Rob I started talking. I well, got I'm off on the side. Uh, why of all the things you could do in publishing was it always just like I'm looking to get into books and oh, there's publicity. That's my way in. Or 
Well, it was more Mark. I mean, I think, as I say, I think I had, I had this sort of glamorous idea of what it might be, what it might be like, but I, but I did know that books was a place I wanted to be. Um, I, I know there are a lot of kids who, and I guess maybe even more so now, because I think kids' lives are so different and there's a lot more pressure on them than there was on me. I graduated from college in 1986 and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I remember on the drive home from school, my dad said to me, oh, you know, there's a new bookstore that opened. It's really cool. It's big, lots of books. That was a Borders. Um, and, and he was like, I think you should get me, you know, maybe you'll go there and see if you get a job there. Just something we were thinking of it as like, just something for the summer. Um, and, um, so I did that and I got the, you know, it's not, wasn't super hard to get that job, but I got that job and, um, books, books have just always been a, um, a home place for me. I don't know how else to say it. You know, I really did. My mother was a massive reader. I I have so many memories of books from my childhood. I have so many memories of um, bringing like a big LL bean bag to the library with my sister and lugging that home and then going to this bookstore, as I say, it's just always been a center in my life. And so I think when, when I graduated from college and was thinking, well, well, and then boom. And another thing I didn't even say, this is another funny little detail that when I moved to New York, I moved in with some college friends who uh, also hadn't found their real job yet. So they were temping, but they um, were working for a temp agency that worked for a lot of publishers. So they were frequently sent to Penguin. So I deliberately went to that temp agency and to sign up in the hopes that I would be sent to Penguin. And on the first day I was sent to Penguin and that temp job turned into a real job. That was my first, first job in, in, in publishing. Now that job was, (laughs) I was sort of a jack of all trades in a weird way. If you're, if your typewriter broke, because in those days, everyone didn't have a computer on their desk. Only the, the top, top executive people had had a computer on their desk. So if your typewriter broke, you called me. If your office was too hot, you called me. If you needed to reserve a conference room, you called me. I was this sort of general person, um, but I moved from there into the children's marketing department. So, sorry, so long-winded. <laughs> if my office is too hot and I call you, what, can, what are you going to do that I can't do? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to call somebody else. That's all I'm going to do. <laughs> I have no HVAC skills, none whatsoever. You just come in with like a giant fan and keep them <laughs> off or <laughs> open the window. Oh, Susan, so thank you. I had much no idea. better than what, yeah, the, what usually would happen is I would say, okay, well, I'll call. And then the person would never call, you know, it was just an endless string of phone tag, me trying to chase down the HVAC guy, because that was definitely not my skill set. Also, if you're looking for a person to organize the conference room schedule, don't hire me, not me. <laughs> Well, I think your resume would be more than a little bit overqualified at this point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'd like to think so. At this point, at this point, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, when, you, when you're thrilled and overjoyed, the dream is coming true at that point. You're in publishing technically, even though you're maybe not doing what you what you want to do, or is it? are you thinking maybe this is not so much for me? What happens that even though you're you're in the room where it happens, so to speak, you end up deciding to go be a librarian for a while? Mm. Well, it's interesting. I think, um, uh, I, I think what uh, drove me to there were a couple things. There were two things. First of all, um, and this is something that I think, um, I wonder how much you get into this with other people, Rob, and, and, and kind of your thoughts about this too, but books are books and, and reading is reading and story is story. And I love all of that. Publishing is a business and I also love the business. Um, but you, I ended up feeling, I got to a a place where I felt um, 
again, let, I was young, I'm, you know, I was in my early twenties, um, but I felt like I wanted to be closer to the books themselves. I wanted to be thinking less about uh, business, 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 and more about books and story. Um, and that's what, that was a big thing that led me to um, think that libraries would be um, a, a place that I would love to be. And, and, I, and I did love being there. Funnily enough, going there then led me back into publishing because I, I took a job being the director of library marketing back at Penguin where, where I had been. So it ended up being kind of a circular thing, um, but that's not what I anticipated when I did it. Um, the other thing is that at that time um, at Penguin, in the basement were the archives, in the basement of the building that the that Penguin's offices were in. They had a couple floors and then they had the basement. And sometimes every once in a while, as an assistant, I would have to go down into the archives to go find uh, an old file on um, the marketing plan for some book or find the old files for whatever. And you, I mean, P Penguin's backlist is like, I mean, it's just magnificent. And there's a number of backlists like that in the business, right? I mean, Harper, Random House, Simon, a lot of, a lot of places have this, but I would go down there to find something and be down there for hours because you could just, you could just pull open the files for Essie Hinton, find little letters she had written when she was 16, when she wrote those, when she wrote The Outsiders, back and forth, editorial back and forth between her and her editor at the time. You could find little notes scribbled on things from Ludwig Bellman's. I mean, it was incredible. And um, being surrounded also, being able to, have, I mean, I didn't go down there a lot, but um, every once in a while having access to that too, I think made me feel like, oh, this is what I love. I love the books, the books, and I want to get, I want to figure out how to be even closer to them. Um, so that was my impulse um, to go back to libraries and, and, and pursue the degree in library science. Which then ends up with you being yeah. the library marketing director. Exactly. Which it all works out and comes together. Exactly. It all, it sort of came back around on itself in a really great way in a really great way. I loved doing library marketing. I think librarians are the best, the best. Me too. We love yeah. you librarians. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Thanks for, yeah. having, for coming by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are, they are out there every day on the front lines, getting kids to fall in love with books there and teachers too, you know, just these are amazing people. And while you're at uh, Penguin, you're also working for Dutton Editorial and you're, you're, you begin acquiring projects, right? Uh, yeah. And, and I don't want to make it sound like it's more than it was. I, I acquired um, a picture book and then there was a short story collection. So I, I acquired a number of different short stories in that collection. Um, and, um, you know, it was more than any, almost more than that. What I think was really valuable about that for me was just the window into that part of the process. Um, and I did attend um, like the weekly editorial meeting. Um, so with my clients, you know, when we get interested in a project and an editor says, okay, I'm going to take this project and share it with my team. Um, you know, I've, I've been in one of those meetings many times because, well, I did this probably over the course of two years. So weekly meetings for two years, that's how long I did it. Um, and um, it just was, it was so fun and, and fascinating to look at the projects that were coming in and talk about them together, try to figure out what kind of potential they had and what they might do in the market. And um, it, I loved, I loved doing that. Um, and I love doing that still with my clients now. It's really one of my favorite parts of the job. Uh, but then I had my, my son and I realized, okay, so I'm essentially doing one job plus another job. Now I have a kid. I'm not gonna, one of these jobs is going to have to go. Um, so that I had to step aside from the editorial at that time. But it's, hold, it's held me in good stead now, I think, you know. 
Well, that gives you the, the, the firsthand experience of what it is to be seeing those submissions, what it is to be convincing somebody within the house that, hey, this is the one we should be working with. All stuff that's going to come in handy throughout your aging career, right? Totally. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And and I think, too, you know, it gives me a window into how much of the job of an editor is to be a marketer, um, how actually they're publicity people, too. Um, because they are, they are trying to get people excited about a project from that first initial meeting. Um, and you don't, you know, hopefully these are colleagues that know you and, and support you and, 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 and want to champion you and what you're interested in, but you want, you want to get them excited and you need to put in that energy for it, you know? Um, otherwise that the, the group may not feel like, oh, this is a project we have to take on. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's really been helpful for me to be able to have that perspective to be able to share with my clients. Well, obviously this would be anecdotal and, and, and years ago now. Um, but did you find that trying to excite other people within an editorial house to be easier or, or harder just because I'm assuming they are um, not hardened is the right word, but they, they've seen some things. They've, they've been around some books. Maybe it takes a little bit more to right. look your hair back than your average person, right? I don't. That's a great question. I do, you. So you're you're wondering is it is it harder to be at that editorial table trying to impress or convince your colleagues, or is it harder to be an agent trying to get an editor to look at it? Is that is that much kind more of coherent question than the one I ask? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, we're going to go with that. Um, I think it's, um, I'm, this is probably a cop-out answer. I think it's just kind of different um, in that you, in it, within, a, within a publishing house, within a w- imprint, let's say, there are more senior folk and newer folk. Do you know what I mean? Younger, younger assistants. And I think there, there is, there is a difference there. You know, the more years and experience you have, the less, um, the more likely it is that you will be able to say, this is a project that I'm excited about and I have a vision for, and I see how to sell it. And it's going to be like X, Y, Z that I did before that, you know, it can, it's not easy I don't think ever um, for an editor to get a project through acquisitions, but it's different the more experience you have and kind of the higher up the hierarchy you are. That's a dynamic that's at play in an editorial meeting, one of many, um, because, you know, it's an office, there's work, there's politics, there's people, you know, whatever it is, there's stuff happening there. Me calling up an editor or or sharing a project with them is different because I'm not you know, obviously I'm not in inside the organization. I'm not inside the institution. The politics part of it is, is different. Um, it, you know, so it's just sort of a different animal. It's a different kind of thing. Um, when you are an agent saying, and I mean, I mean, if you're a good agent, you know, you have really strong relationships um, with editors and you're, you, they want to hear from you. Um, and you're there to do that convincing that then hopefully they will be doing with their team. You're almost kind of modeling. I think of it sometimes as like, I'm p- giving you the words that you could use when you are at editorial meeting um, to talk about this book and you know how, how exciting it is. Um, so it's just a different, it's just a different kind of conversation, I think. So um, without giving away your secret sauce, because every every agent's got their own special techniques that they like to use to, to ensure mm-hmm. their clients are the most successful. Um, but I am assu- what, what what kind of materials are you putting together to arm them to be the salesperson for this book? Because you've got to convince them so thoroughly that they're going to be able to convince everybody else to get on right. board. Right. Well, it's different for different projects. Um, I think. Um, I mean, really. What matters most um, at the end of the day is that the pages of the project, whether that's the pages of a picture book or a YA novel or a graphic novel, whatever it is, are as strong and as compelling as they can possibly be. And that, that's what I work 
on hardest and most with my clients is, is refining the project and revising it um, to where, you know, it, it is shining like gold, you know, that's what we're looking for. Knowing of course that they will edit more when they get acquired. So, you know, there will be more work to do um, always, um, but, but getting it as good and as close as we can get it. Um, depending on the project, sometimes you might want to do uh, a proposal. There's always a pitch letter that goes, that goes with it that I write and I try to um, include all the, you know, a really snappy story description that I think is going to be compelling and grab people's attention, but also cover all the sort of pertinent sales hooks that I think are there um, for the story. Um, in terms of positioning it. So always using um, competitive titles so that the editor can kind of instantly understand like, oh, she's thinking this, this kind of a book. Um, and if there are other key, um, I, I sold a picture book um, last year that um, had to do with plants and gardening and flowers and, you know, through the course of the pandemic. And, and even before that, there's been this like houseplant love um thing happening on the internet you know and so we we pulled together some some numbers about you know how many facebook groups there were and how many millions of people are you know buying new house that kind of stuff just to help that was like a little bit of ammunition that i thought that the editor might be able to use when she went into um, her meeting to um discuss it with sales and marketing left so talking about the market thinking about what the sales hooks are um sometimes you just want to talk about the book and why the book is just amazing um depending on the project there also are these other kind of points that i will bring up in the pitch letter yeah, no, we uh, bought a greenhouse right at the start of the pandemic. Yeah. The store shelves were empty. We're like, we might have to learn farming real fast. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> I know everything, everything was sold out, right? It was because we were all trying to figure out what to do with all that time at home. How's the greenhouse going? Or books, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. True. How's your, how's the greenhouse? How's it growing? It's going well. My uh, son and my wife uh, tend to it, and uh, he eats most of the plants as they as we grow them. So it's that's it's awesome. Sort of a hobby, then we can sustain ourselves if society shuts down tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good time. All right, you could go off grid any minute. I love it. That's great, well, though. Well, we'll have to expand. We'll need a second or third green. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can. <laughs> no problem. You got it. Now you know how to do it. It's perfect. That's great. So, uh, I've talked to a few uh, folks, had, had the good fortune um, to, to have some folks on the show who told us about uh, their experience editing. And it seems fairly common that they get to a point where they have a child or two, and then it's time to look at agenting. So what is it about uh, becoming a, a parent that, that makes agenting maybe a more attractive prospect than being a, a, an editor? Well, that's so interesting. Um, I think I think there is a certain amount of flexibility um, in agenting in terms of when you do it and how you do it. I have, I am lucky to have this office at home, but we also have um, Upstart Pro has an office um, that's sort of like a, a half hour walk from where I live, which is great. Um, but I can go there. I can be here as ever I need to be. My kids are older now, so. I'm actually pretty nine to five, um, but um, certainly when they were younger, the flexibility was really, really important for me. Um, also for me, um, I think I love the independence and the autonomy. I think a lot of different agencies work differently. Um, but at, at Upstart Pro, at the agencies that I've been, because I was at the Bent Agency before this, something that I love about both of those places is that there's really a ton of freedom in terms of who it is that I decide to take on as clients. And um, 
Upstart Crow. I have the most amazing colleagues. I love all of them. We are constantly talking together, sharing notes, putting together ideas about what to do for this client and, and feedback on, on writing from the client. So I, I feel like I really have a whole team with me, but I'm kind of a mini business within a, a business. Um, and I love, I love that. I love running my own show. Uh, basically. Um, I don't know if that directly relates to having a kid or I have two kids um, to having kids or not. Um, maybe, but anyway, it sort of all coincided um, for me. Well, let's talk a little bit about Upstart Crow. Um, so I assume cool. that if you want to take on a client, you're doing it. You don't need to check with the rest of the agency. They don't right. get to weigh in and say, no, Susan, not this one. Or yes, Susan, you should definitely. Correct. Why'd Correct. You I mean, I do share, you know, I, that's not to say that I don't share stuff from clients that I'm considering um, with my colleagues, because I, as I say, I mean, I, I, I adore them and value their opinion highly, but I am, I, I do not have to do that. And I frequently don't do that. And you know what it is more often for picture books, we, I, I would share somebody because I love to hear what other people think about the art, the illustration style. If I'm looking at an author illustrator for novels, that's really just more of a me decision. And you know, each other's taste pretty well. So that if you're looking at something like I'm just not a hundred percent on board, but I think that my co-agent yeah. like this, you know, who to refer that to, right? Yeah, totally. Totally. Uh, and then uh, I, I like to ask everybody, I like to give you just a, a nice open spot to talk a little bit about the Upstart Crow. So of all the agencies that an esteemed audience could be sending their queries to, why is Upstart Crow the best? Oh, well, here's what I, here's what I love about Upstart Crow. So I, first, I already talked about one part of it, and that's the fact that we are a really tight-knit group, the agents at Upstart Crow. So the agents at Upstart Crow are me, obviously. Um, and then there's Alex Penfold, Danielle Chiotti, and um, Kayla Ticello. And um, we are, are always talking together and supporting each other and um, really helping each other out. Um, and I feel like um, having you, you, you know, if you're my client, you, you will not, you're never going to be in contact with any of those other people. You're always going to be talking to me, but that, um, sort of invisible, but very real support that is behind, behind every client at the agency, I think is, um, really massive. Um, in addition, we are a small, we're a small agency um, and none of us have a massive list of clients. And what that means is that all of us individually and so the agency as a whole are really able to be very focused on each client's um, work, what's happening with them, building their career, thinking big picture, as well as, all right, what do we need to do on this edit right now? Um, that, that ability to think think kind of dimensionally um, given what's going on at a moment, I think is really, really um, special. I also, the, where we come from is a little bit different than I think at some agencies. Um, Alex was an editor. Oh, I forgot to mention Michael Stearns also, he runs the agency. He doesn't have his own clients, but he, he runs the agency and he's always in conversation with all of us. So. Alex was an editor, Michael was an editor, um, Danielle was an editor, I was on the marketing side, and Kayla came from um, SCBWI. So that, that background, that experience on the publishing side, um, but also, you know, Kayla's experience at SCBWI, I think it gives us a perspective on the business that is um, different than some other agencies. We really really understand what it's like on the other side of the desk. I think that means that we can provide perspective and kind of intel on what's happening um, out there um, once the client's work is out there in the world that um, isn't always, isn't always um, out there um, in some other agencies. So. 
we're just the best, Rob. We are. <laughs> you really are. <laughs> and you're you're full service, right? So all rights are going to be represented. You're going yes. to be shopping for movie deals and foreign rights and, yes. and audio books and everything. Else. Yeah, totally. So Michael actually handles the, the subsidiary rights. And one thing that I love about the agency is that we are small, but we work with a lot of um, direct he, through Michael. He manages those relationships. He works directly with a lot of foreign rights agencies all around the world. Um, so we have, we have really good coverage and, and, you know, territories everywhere. And Michael is also really in touch with people on the film and TV side and, and always talking up the books, sharing the books, you know, and, and making those connections happen too. So uh, some smaller agencies, I think people sometimes have, they work with one um, foreign rights person who that foreign, then they will be in touch with the different sub agents. We're kind of one less middleman there. And I think it makes a big difference in terms of just making sure that you're getting more rights secured. Yeah, yeah, just being closer to the process and more directly in touch um, with what's what's happening when we send something out to the foreign agents, what they're hearing, what the feedback is, how it's going. We are just closer to that than in some other agencies. Gotcha. And how many clients are you representing at the moment? I, I'm, you know what, I'd have to go actually exactly count right now, but I, I'm about 30 people. And I am, I mean, I always am, I don't think I'm ever going to be a person there. You know, there are some agents who have a really big list, uh, like 60 people. And that's, that's never going to be me. I'm, I'm not, I don't, uh, it's just different styles. Um, that's too, that would be too many for me, but I would, I am always looking to grow. I would like to be sort of in the 35, maybe a little bit more than that, but I'm, I'm close to the top of where I think a good number of people for me is. How actively are you seeking clients at this, at this oh, point? Very. I mean, I'm always looking always, always. I mean, I have a more full list than when I started, you know what I mean? And I, so I'm not, I don't have a ton of empty spots that I think I'm trying to, that I feel like I'm trying to fill, but you know, I want to fall in love. I'm always looking to fall in love with something new and, and exciting. I'm particularly focused right now on, I am slowly, slowly building my um, author illustrator list. I have, I think, six author illustrators right now, and I'd like to grow that. I have six author illustrators and uh, two graphic novel people. So that's actually kind of eight artists, storytellers. Um, and I, I would like to grow that, but I don't want to rush that part. I mean, I'm happy to be building pretty slowly on that side where I, what I really am hungry for right now is more middle grade and YA, but especially middle grade. So, um, I agree in middle grade. I think I'm in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> Only the finest middle grade authors listen to this show. So they're going to be sending you Perfect. top notch That's stuff. That's who I'm looking for. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you a couple of things about uh, what you got up on um, uh, on, on manuscript wish list. I, one, you had the most specific request I think I've ever seen of anybody's. <laughs> you want a YA set in 1980s Moscow against the backdrop of Para. I can't even say it. Para. Perestroika. I don't. I'm probably not saying it right myself. <laughs> I'm going to defer to you. <laughs> that might be the most specific <laughs> ancient. Uh, desire. What is it about that about that time that that would appeal to you? Well, it's. I mean, first of all, it's a pretty thrilling moment in history, right? I mean, talk about change. Talk about things evolving every day, um, very quickly, and um, in a direction that I think felt surprising. You know. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a child of the 80s. I mean, I grew up, in, I came of age in the 80s. So I think that the real answer to your question is that's why, because I remember that time. Um, and I, um, so I said that I graduated from college in 1986 and I had a friend who went straight from college to, she studied Russian in college and, and foreign, um, foreign international studies, sorry. And she went and worked in Moscow um, f for a couple of years after graduation. And so I was getting letters from her every day talking about like, oh my God, now this is happening. Oh my gosh, all these changes are happening. And really, 
you know, how the USSR, how the Soviet Union evolved in that period to something different um, was, it, it wasn't something that I thought, I mean, I was just a kid growing up and hearing about USSR and the Iron Curtain, but that wasn't something that I thought was possible, really. Um, but big change is possible. <laughs> and um, so it's just a very intriguing time to me. Um, so yeah, I'd love a story set then. That's an old, that's an old one, Rob. You're digging, you're really doing the research. I like this. It's still true though. I want that story. Well, I know you're also, at the time, you were fascinated by Selkies. I had to look that up. I didn't know what a uh, Selkie was. Is that still true or has, it, has your Selkie itch been, been? Well, that's a funny one. That's an interesting one. So you looked up what a Selkie is, right? I did, but you you tell the steamed audience. Okay, so a Selkie, a Selkie is, um, they're, they're, they're creatures of Celtic myth. Um, so sort of Northern British Isles, Ireland, and um, they're, they're essentially kind of, they're very similar to mermaids. So the idea is it's a, a woman who is half seal, half woman, and she can swim in the ocean like a seal, but she can also come out of the ocean and take off her pelt, her seal pelt and become a woman. And if you steal her pelt, um, you can uh, keep her away from it. You can keep her um, cause she's not going to leave. She's not going to leave the house if she knows her pelt is somewhere in the house. It's, it's almost like she can't get too far from her pelt. She has to stay near wherever that is. So if you hide it somewhere, she'll, she'll stay. And in a lot of the stories, a man falls in love with a Selkie and steals her coat and, and thereby keeps her until one day she finds it and escapes. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I, I lived in Scotland um, for a year in college. I'm fascinated with the stories from that part of fairy tale and folk tales from, from that part of the world. And there's something quite to me, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very fantastical and there's something really sad in that idea, right? Of someone falling in love with somebody but needing to steal a part of them and and secret that part away from the person to keep them um that's probably what's at the core of what i find fascinating about that story it's sort of romantic and tragic and sad all at the same time um unfortunately i will say i'm not interested in mermaids i know that's a bizarre distinction to make <laughs> because they are really pretty similar um but i'm not particularly interested in mermaid stories and i think people see the word selkie and think oh well i've got a mermaid story that's pretty close let me send it and it's not to say that i would never take on a mermaid story one thing i've learned is never say never you don't know you know i'll say i don't want any mermaid stories and then tomorrow the greatest one ever will come and i'll be like oh my god i love mermaid stories so um but often what happens is i get a mermaid story that's not exactly what I'm looking for. So, but still on the hunt. If you've got a romantic, kind of tragic, selkie story, I'm your girl. And you heard her esteemed audience. If it's set in, <laughs> in Russia, you're pretty much guaranteed. Oh my her. God. If it's in the <laughs> Moscow River, I'm in. <laughs> Done. I wonder what the Russian. I wonder what the Russian folktale version of the Selkie is. There, there might be one. Huh. I'm gonna have to figure that out. Anyway, I'm sure there is, and I'm sure yeah. it's uh, a little bit harsher. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. A little colder. Colder. It's got to be very cold. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone dies at the end. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> So um, something else that, uh, that you had asked for at one point is you are looking for middle grade, that uh, dark middle grade that pushes the boundaries of upper middle grade. So what are those boundaries and how do you know when you've crossed over them? Mm, what a great question. Um, so I think those boundaries have to do with um, different things in different stories, but probably things like how scary um, the story, if, if it's a creepy story, how creepy it could get, it gets, how 
how scary it gets. If it's a story about, um, if it's a story, well, this is in kind of what I said, right? I said a dark stories, but that darkness at the, at the upper edge of middle grade, I think if there's a dark element in a story, it could get darker. I know that's not a great explanation. Um, taking a step back from the specifics, I think um, something that's happening in books right now, and, it, and it's been happening for a while, this is not going to be news to anybody, but um, every everything's middle grade and YA are pushing up in terms of what kind of content you might imagine seeing being published for a YA audience and a middle grade audience. And so a book that that is now would read like middle grade, you know, 20 years ago would probably have been published as YA. Um, and, but it is as, as our culture changes and kids are more sophisticated, you know, what they might've happily read when they were 15 or 16, they're now ready for maybe when they're a little bit younger. And so that's part of what I mean about like content that we might've thought wouldn't work for middle grade now at the upper end of middle grade can work. Um, also part of what I mean there is that I think that as, as things are aging up like that, um, I think there's a need for books, um, for readers who are at the kind of in-between place. Middle grade, I think of as spanning, and, and Rob, I'd be interested to hear what you think the, the age range is, because it's different, you know, it's di there is no hard and fast, but sort of third grade at the youngest, very youngest end, maybe, maybe call it fourth grade to eighth grade. And then YA is, is, you know, a high school readership. Well, the difference between say somebody who's in fifth grade and somebody who's in eighth grade is huge. And I think there is a cohort of kids on the upper end. So sort of probably eighth grade and ninth grade that there aren't a ton of books um, that are just right for that readership, in my opinion, that are, for instance, a rule about middle grade, a rule, quote unquote, I mean, you know, is, is like you would have, you know, a crush, but not a full on romance. Um, I know a lot of eighth graders that are in serious, complicated romantic relationships. And there, where is that story? Where is that book? Um, and that's one of the things I mean about pushing the boundary at the upper upper end of, of middle grade, that as an example. Um, I'm, I'm very excited and interested in books that are about the in-between place between solid middle school, fifth grade, sixth grade, and solid high school, 11th grade, you know? There's, a, there's that middle place where I don't know. I, I've actually, I think there are a lot of editors that are interested in this, in this gap as well. And so there are more books um, coming in that, in that range, but I, I, I am excited about seeing more. So with that, what do you think, what do you think of being the range, Rob, like for middle grade? As like far the, um, I mean, I, I go by the different guides that are available. I know that by the time you're talking eighth, ninth grade, I would think that at least some, uh, if not outright sex, some sensuality would probably be appropriate for that crowd. Right. Um, right. Certainly some violence, um, although yeah. maybe going down a bit. Uh, and some profanity, I don't know, if so there's somebody that counts all the F-bombs and says, nope, that's officially YA now, or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. Language is a funny one because, you know, it can set off alarm bells for certain people. It's if you live in this country and you are hearing language all the time, you know, watch TV for five minutes, you hear it. It's like, you know, but anyway, yeah. I'm not my kid. He'll, well, he's never heard a, a bad word and he read it in your book and now he's ruined. <laughs> <laughs> 
rats, I'm sorry. <laughs> I do uh, find it sort of amusing um, to think of children having to live in this world, but being sheltered uh, from some profanity that they've, you know, that, that they've heard, uh, probably at home from the parent objecting. Exactly. <laughs> really, you know. I mean, I, w- I really would have, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Something I found uh, amusing is when I wrote uh, All Together Now, Available Now, esteemed audience, a, a zombie story way back when, um, is uh, I, I realized that I, I have yet to be proven wrong on this, that if I left out uh, sex and there's very, there's talk of sex, but there's no actual explicit sex and there's no profanity whatsoever, I could get away with literal murder. That's the most violent mm-hmm. book just from start to finish. And everyone says, well, that's fine. <laughs> that's no that's problem. our whole culture, right? Oh, yeah. That's our that's American culture. I mean, specifically right now, that feels very uh, true. Um, but also, if you look at movies, if you look at everything, um, we are more accustomed to seeing violence um, than we are accustomed to seeing. Um, other other things that are considered you know too too much for for kids there's a, i think there's a lot of examples of of what you're talking about where there's, there's plenty of violence in the pages you know so well, i know just anecdotally talking to students at our local school that um, are you know maybe in sixth seventh grade who are in family situations that contain all of those elements but are um, being restricted and what they're able to read that might reflect the, the situation right. they find themselves right. in. Right, yeah. Ah, well, that's- Yeah, that, that's, that that's doesn't seem podcast. to necessarily make sense, but right, that's maybe a different, maybe a different topic. <laughs> podcast will solve America right now. Right. We'll- <laughs> yeah, just focus on middle grade for right now. <laughs> So, okay, so esteemed audience is listening. They know that there's uh, only five spots, so don't be number six. They're very excited to, to, to get in your inbox uh, once you're open for queries. Um, they're going to send you a query plus 20 pages. When you go to look at that query, what's going to turn your head? What are you most looking to see? Um, what I love, uh, what I think is my kind of the thing that I love the most um, or what really sucks me into a story is falling in love with a character um, and and feeling who that character is, feeling like I am really connected to them, invested in them, and caring about what's happening to them. I, I really want that to happen in those first 20 pages that um, are in the query. Um, it even starts in the query letter itself. And I, I, there's a lot of information out there on writing queries. I don't know that we want to get into that, but it, I think people can get intimidated by the process and it can feel hard and it is hard. It is hard. But I also think that the key thing in the query is to get across the character and their, their conflict, their problem. Um, so it even starts within the query itself. Um, so that's really, for me, the big important thing. Um, voice is, is, is also really important. Um, I am not always looking for the, um, the, the, the showiest voice. Um, I love, I love a strong voice. That's very exciting to me. Um, but I really want the voice to just be deeply connected to the character. Um, And given your character, the voice might be um, not um, chock full of metaphor or, you know, incredibly rich. It just depends. Um, And I I really want it to be deeply tied into who that that character is. Um, So that's kind of the very first important thing. And the next thing is plot and story. I I want something exciting to happen. I, I have always loved, and I, I love a strong plot and I want to find out what's going to happen next. I've always been a reader for that and I still am. Um, so those two things are what I'm, what I'm really looking for. And I think too, um, you know, feeling like this is a writer who is in, com- in command of their material. They, they, they are, um, giving me that feeling of, of authority in the writing 
that is also um, just a great feeling. In terms of things like what kind of genre or, you know, particular settings or story, you know, story ideas, I'm really totally open. There isn't anything. I'm not, um, let's see, what do I, oh, I'm not a person who totally loves animal books, like animal characters talking at, at like the mid no, in, in a novel. That's, that's not something I usually am drawn to, but never say never. Um, so um, I'm really totally open. I want to be moved and I want to be connected to the character. That's what I'm really looking for. Oh, and I also say I, I like to be surprised. I mean, I don't mean like, <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> but like something that feels um, just a little surprising is a really, really good element to have too. So. Dear Susan Hawk, I saw you recently on the Middle Grade Ninja podcast. You made the following brilliant points that connected with me. Let me tell you about my Selkie book in Russia. And then you want to know <laughs> uh, a little bit about the author, I assume. Yes. What kind of, stuff, what kind of info, or do you just go straight to that? Because you've got 20 pages. Of no, books. I read the query. I read the query and then I read the pages. Um, the query is important. I mean, again, like I don't want people, I think people get freaked out about the query. Um and um, I don't think people should be freaked out about the query because I think that um, there's so much material on the internet about how to put a good one together that I think, you know, if you, if you dig in, you will find ample, ample help in doing that. But it's important because what it, here's what, what I, I love to see at the top of a query. Um, and it doesn't have to be like this. It is particularly helpful for me if it is the first couple of lines say, here is my book X, Y, Z you know, 45,000 words long, give me the word count. Um, tell me what um, comparison titles, um, you know, what books you think are related to yours in some way that might be a good way to shorthand to me. Oh, this is a book that's kind of like this one and kind of like that one. It doesn't always, the comp titles don't always have to actually be books. It could be a movie, it could be a show, it could be something else, but at least one kid's book. Um, that's incredibly helpful to me because right away, um, it sort of positions me on the map of children's literature. Oh, I'm on the continent of middle grade. I'm in this town of fantasy. Um, you know, like I instantly know where I am, um, when people make good comparisons and having the word count is helpful in terms of just understanding like, right. Okay. So this isn't a, a 200,000 word middle grade novel, which is probably a sign that there's a problem, <laughs> you know, so that, that information so right, is 250,000 words is the, is the bare minimum. I could tell my story. <laughs> you know, push boundaries and it. <laughs> well, you know, that's probably true for something, for something. Um, but I think get, for me, that kind of, that kind of information right up front, um, is really helpful to have because it positions, it positions the book. And so that's what the query letter is for. It's, it's sort of putting me in the, you know, giving me a little preview and getting my brain in the right spot to receive the pages. And then, and then I read the pages. They're both important to me. At the end of the day, though, what really matters are the pages. If the query is like not quite hitting it right, but I fell in love with the pages, that's all I need to know. Gotcha. Um, so you love you love the pages. You request the full. That one's pretty good with a couple of rounds of revision that you're going to suggest to the author. Um, what happens next at that point? I assume you, you do some kind of call and you're going to be evaluating the author and you're looking at social media. How are you deciding was this um, something? That I, I don't look very much at social media. That's just me. I think that that's very different from agent to agent. Um, I, I really, what I want to do is I want to get on the phone and talk to that person about the book and talk to them about what I think we will need to cover in revision. If we need to, if we don't really need to do anything, then I'll say that. But, um, what I want to make sure both for me and for the writer is that we are seeing eye to eye in terms of what. I think I need to ask for in terms of revision. If I have, you know, if I'm coming to the writer and saying this whole middle section, we got to take it out. 
and that is not what the writer wants to do, then we're probably not a good fit. So I'm trying to be as upfront and clear as I can about what I think I'll be asking for or, or wanting to talk about in revision and, and, and hopefully start the conversation right there on the phone. I, um, never want a writer to feel like they can't, it's not a conversation, uh, because at the end of the day, it's not my, it's not my book. Um, it's, it's the writer's book. So, um, but if it feels like we're on the same page about that, um, you know, we talk a lot about the process, what submission will be like, you know, what happens if I, if, if the book doesn't sell, um, some people want to talk about what happens if we're, if we've decided we're not going to be able to work together for whatever reason anymore, what, what happens then different people have different questions, but I want to answer every question they have. Um, I, I never want my clients to feel like they're in the dark. I, um, am, try to be as transparent about everything as I can be and as communicative as I can be. That's part of the reason why I don't want to have a list that's like 60 people long because um, communication and transparency, it takes time. Um, and I need to be able to have that time for all of my clients. Um, so yeah, so if that conversation feels like we're in the same page about revisions and we've connected, um, then I, I'll hope we can work together. That sounds like a plan to me. Uh, just out of curiosity, I, I think this is probably a bad idea, but if an author is thinking she wants to cut out the whole middle section and she wants to take <laughs> 250,000 book down to 100,000, um, or, or I guess 30,000. Uh, yeah, really. <laughs> Even more. Um, I don't want to do that, but you're the only agent that's showing interest. So I'll say, yes, I, we could do that. And then I'm going to be a little bit combative along the way. Is that worth it? Are we wasting everybody's time if, if an author is thinking that way? Yeah. Yeah. It's just going to be frustrating for everybody. And it's not, it's not really worth it. Um, I've never had that happen. Um, <laughs> or people are really pulling the wool over my eyes and I'm not realizing it, but um, I have never <laughs> had since it's going great <laughs> <laughs> um I yeah that wouldn't I just think it would be it certainly would be um confusing for me you know what I mean like if we just talked about this and you seemed on board but now you're not um I mean, I would just want to talk about that with the person and try to hear what they're saying about it but I ultimately think it would be super frustrating for the writer um so why, why put yourself in that position? You know what I mean? Where you're going to be hearing for the writer to put themselves in a position where they're going to be hearing feedback that they neither believe in nor can take. I mean, why do that? Seems painful. Gotcha. Well, thankfully, the authors who are, are listening to us on this show are all honest, straightforward, yeah. straight, straight yeah. shooters. They know. Um, so now comes to a point where, okay, well, we're going to sell this book, obviously, and then we're going to plan for the longer career. What kind of conversations mm -hmm. are going on around there? How do you go about making a plan? One of my favorite parts, I love talking about the big picture um, and then sort of scaling it back down to the where we are right now. Um, but I mean, it sort of starts with okay, let's talk about, you know, what your next ideas are. What's, what, what do you, are there any ideas sort of bubbling around in the back of your head or maybe quite, um, maybe some of the new ideas are way more developed than that and you're already working on them. But I love talking about um, what are, what's new, what's in, what ideas do you have? S some people need to kind of write into it for a while and, um, and sort of see where it's going and they don't always necessarily have the whole idea ready right at the outset um other people are are more um plotters um and they they can they can send me like you know a couple of really concrete thumbnails for a couple different story ideas um so that's sort of one level the kind of what's the next book level and if if you know we something we'll be talking about um, is if the first book was a middle grade book, 
Um, should the next book be a middle grade book? What if you want to write a YA novel? What if you want to write a picture book? Um, when's the ideal time to do that? Um, you know, usually um, what I think is, is helpful in terms of building career is to follow up you know, with a similar, uh, with a project that's in a, the same um, age category. So if your first book was a middle grade novel, it's great. If your next book's going to be a middle grade novel, that's not always how it's going to go. Um, and I'm really open to talking about that and strategizing, well, okay, if the next book's going to be middle grade, I mean, I'm sorry, YA, where do we go with that? How's that going to work? What's that going to look like? How do we keep building the middle grade part of your career as well as the YA side of things? You know, how, how doing all of that is really exciting and interesting to me. And I mean, I'm not, all constantly asking my clients this, but it's ultimately the, the, the big, big picture question is, you know, what is the book that you are most excited about writing? What is the project that you is closest to, to your heart and the one that you're maybe scared to write, the book you needed as a kid? What are those projects and how do we create a path that lets you write all those books, whether they're in the same category or not. How do we stack it? How do we approach it? How do we put that all together? That's a conversation that I love, love having. So in the situation where we're writing a middle grade right now, and then the next one's gonna be a gritty YA, mm -hmm. um, and then I'm gonna switch back to middle grade, is that an idea of now you've gotta do twice as much work off there because you're basically gotta fuel both readerships or is that a smart idea in case one of them doesn't do so well? Well, this, this new sale is completely, this is a completely untested market for this author. Right. I mean, I don't, it, it is certainly at the, uh, how many hours does a human have in the day is a really important question. <laughs> um, and making sure that you're not, um, uh, getting yourself into a situation where you're going to get completely burned out is, is really important. Being able to, I just was having a conversation with one of my clients today about, we sold a lot of books for her last year. She's a picture book writer. So she's, it, these are shorter texts, but they're really challenging in their own way and take a lot of time too. Um, and um, so she's been just like, breakneck speed with deadline, 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 deadline. And she was saying, I, I, I've got to take some time. Um, and we were talking about how it's really important for her to have the mental space because otherwise, she, you know, now she's got a lot of things in the pipeline um, because of the, you know, how long it takes books to come out. It's like 2024 is going to be a big year for her, but looking forward beyond that, somehow, she has to carve out the time to think of what's coming after. Um, and you can't fill yourself with so many deadlines that you don't have space for that. So there, there is that. Um, but I mean, I guess I tend to believe that ultimately there is a way, if, if, if my client is passionate about writing a project, be it in the same category or a different one, there's a way to make it all work. Um, it's, it's up to the, the writer and like kind of what they want to accomplish and, and how they pace themselves. Um, and I think there's a lot of writers who are like, they just like to juggle a lot of things and they want to do a lot and they, you know, then it's my job to keep up with that. And then there are other people who need to go slower. They just do. Um, and that's fine too. So um, if, I know you do brainstorming sessions with your clients as well. And if they're talking about, I've got three different ideas and I maybe feel the most passionate about this one, but you just heard an editor say, God, I'd buy this other idea in a moment. That's one of the three. Do you right. tell them like, hey, I mean. Oh, sure. Yeah, want, yeah, yeah. But... yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I think, one of the core things that I do for why you want an agent. Um, because hopefully they have those connections and kind of a sense of what editors are looking for. So absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Gotcha. That's, that's also really fun to be able to say like, well, but I know that XYZ at this house is looking for something just like this. So, so yeah, that's a, that's a fun thing to be able to do. 
Ryan says, but no, I'm only passionate about talking animals. And I've got four more books for you. Just talking animals. <laughs> and they're each 200,000 words long. So, you know, <laughs> cool. Great. Both talking Great. animals. A lot to um, say. <laughs> uh yeah no i no you know at the end of the day i don't want anybody writing for the market you know and i don't want anybody writing something they're not excited about it's always about the venn diagram right of like me talking about the market and what i think is going to sell and where that overlaps with what somebody is passionate about and excited about why wouldn't you want somebody to write to the market um, because I want, because I think when people are trying to write to the market, they're often chasing a trend. And by the time there's books out in the market, um, meaning like a trend, often those books were acquired two years ago. The pipeline for that kind of trend is is maybe full already. So the way because book publishing is so slow, um, it can it can be frustrating to sort of be writing. In, in a way that's like, oh, I think um, books about uh, um, uh, unicorns are hot. So I'm going to write a unicorn book. Um, but then when you finish your unicorn book and you and then I go to take it out, everybody says, oh, we already have a unicorn book. So that was a trend from, you know, I was acquiring those books two years ago. That's the kind of writing to the market that I mean that I don't think is helpful. Understanding the market, knowing you know, what books are winning awards, what books are really commercially successful. Sometimes a, an award-winning book can also be super commercially successful. I mean, understanding all of that is super important and necessary, but then trying to um, only, um, you know, kind of follow is, I don't think it's a prescription um, for, um, I don't think it's necessarily a prescription for selling a ton of books. It could be, it could be. But in general, I find that if you're writing to what you're excited about and what you're passionate about, the stories that you want to tell and that are feel wrote, most directly connected to who you are as a writer and as a person, that's, that's what I'm excited about. Because the reader is going to pick up on that passion and that's going to get them excited ultimately, right? That's what I, that's what I think too. Yeah. Makes sense to me. I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> well, watching our, our time and it's, it's flying by, and I, there's a few things I, that I absolutely have to make sure I ask you about. One, I always uh, we've talked a little bit about the pandemic, but it seems like publishing, along with the rest of the country, has just been tossed in the air. Everything is a little bit different coming out. We've seen some high-profile exits from publishing uh, on social media by associate editors and, and otherwise. But we know that the far too many people within publishing aren't being paid what they're worth. Yeah. So then there's consolidation. There's all sorts of doom and gloom, uh, mm -hmm. but also things are changing. So where do you see publishing as an industry right now? And mm -hmm. where do you see us going into the future? As best you can. Well, Rob, I did bring my crystal ball. You'll be oh, happy perfect. to know. So I've got all the answers. What's the trend um, three years from now? Let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where do I see publishing right now? Okay, well, I think we're in an interesting spot because um, over the course of the pandemics, uh, uh, pandemics, pandemic, please, only one, um, books did actually pretty well. Sales were pretty strong. Um, we're seeing some of that start to change now and kind of level off, but there hasn't really been a, a, a big change in terms of acquisitions. Editors are still taking on books, still paying in some cases a lot of money for them. Um, so I think in that sense, it's been, you know, it's, it's been good to see how resilient um, the book business can be. Um, I also think that not going to the office every day. I mean, this is something we're all experiencing in every, you know, whether you're in book publishing or anything, right? Not going into the office changes everything. And, and a way that I think it is really, what just one of many ways in which um, it's different now is in terms of editors reading time and um, the acquisitions process is really longer in a lot of cases than it was before. Um, because editors are so 
their days are structured really differently now. And the same time that they had um, for reading um, submissions is just, most editors that I talk to are just saying, it's just not there in the same way that it was before. So that's a difference. Um, I think um, in terms of the future and looking forward, I mean, um, something that is really exciting to me, um, I, I've been in book publishing in one way or another for, you know, a while since like, let's just say 30 years. And um, the conversation that has been happening for a while now, a really important one about representation and diversity in the books, um, but also within publishing houses is so important. And I, I think that what is happening now is feels more like permanent um, substantive change um, than I have seen in the past. It's still not enough. There's still so much more work to do. Um, but I really feel, um, and I feel really happy, um, that the changes that we've seen, the books that are on the bestseller list, um, all that, it, it really feels um, like there are some deep changes that are being made. And I'm super glad for that. And I, I think, I hope, that we will continue to see more of that as we go forward. So. The question I ask everybody, and this segues perfectly, is what are you doing and what is Upstart Crow doing to continue that trend to increase diversity within publishing? Um, I I think that you know a big a big thing that I am doing is just always looking at my you know my list and trying to um, find voices there that are writers that are are different um and that are not you know that are diverse um and that are writing stories that are diverse as well um and i think actually an upstart crow has really had if you look at the list across across all of us um it, it it's something that that all of the agents at upstart crow have been um interested in and 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 working on for a really long time. Some of the very oldest clients of the agency um, are people of color and LGBTQ writers. Um, so um, I think that is really, I think that's one of the most important things that you know an agent can really be doing is constantly looking at her list and who's on her list and um, where are you finding new talent new writers from. I don't always like to ask about self-publishing and this with the ease of self-publishing. Uh, lots of authors who might be listening to us who will want to query you may have a self-published book. Maybe it sold well, maybe it didn't sell well. Mm -hmm. Does that impact how you're going to be considering new work from them? It's not new work, meaning a project that they have self-published in the past, right. not, past no, no, but, not, the but not what they're querying. Something brand new that they haven't published yeah. and want to try maybe do a little I, bit of hybrid publishing with. Right. I, I am, I am not, it is, it is like, I think it used to be that self, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about a while ago, it's been different for a while, but you know, self-publishing was kind of like, oh, um, but um, I think that, um, there are just so many more ways to get the book people's for people to get their books out there now. And so um, it's exciting if somebody is interested in self-publishing. I don't know a ton about that. I, uh, if somebody wants to self pub I've had a, a, a one client was like, you know, I want to try to take this story um, and, and self-publish it and put it up on, I can't remember what platform she was using, but she wanted to put it up on a, a platform where people could, um, you know, read it. Um, and she really wanted to do that. And so, you know, that was exciting and cool. It was a project she kind of managed on her own. Um, but it is, if somebody has self-published in the past and is now looking to go traditional, that's cool by me. I'm excited and interested to see what they've, you know, what their new project is. And, you know, if they have 
if they have a, a, a readership that they're developing from self-publishing, you know, hopefully that would translate um, to a traditionally published book. So that's, that's great. Uh, makes sense to me. And Susan Hawk, uh, have you yep. ever seen a flying saucer and or a goat? <laughs> I'm so excited about this question, Rob. Oh, this no. is a question that I was like, oh my gosh, what? Because you say I'm going to ask you about these things, but doesn't say what you're going to ask me about these things. So I'm so, so excited to get to this point. Uh, have I ever seen a flying saucer or a ghost? Is that, or the, that's the question? Those two, but don't hold out on me if you've seen Bigfoot or a leprechaun or... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think I have. I don't think I have. I, I, I wish I had. I would be, I would be up for it. Or would I be too scared? I don't know. But yeah, no, I can't say that I ever have. I can't say that I ever have. What about you? Oh, um, well, I'm here every week. Uh, so esteemed audience has heard I've got a ghost story that every time I've tried to tell it, there is no way to tell it that's appropriate for a middle grade audience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I've not seen a flying saucer, but my grandmother did see one and I believe her. Um, and at this point, the, the government's come right out and said, yeah, yeah, they're out there. We've got them. Yeah. I mean, it just seems unbelievable that it's not true. Do you know what I mean? Like, of course, we're not the only planet with living beings. It can't be. So there's something else out there. That's what I think. The idea that we're the only ones and some invisible person created all this just for us, that CRXP is a very human idea. <laughs> exactly. I could not agree with you more. The ghost thing seems harder to me a little bit because... I don't know. It just feels like if there are ghosts, wouldn't we all know about? I don't know. Wouldn't wouldn't they be around more? I don't know. <laughs> but then again, there's been stories of ghosts forever. So maybe that just shows you that they're there they are. Just not everybody can see them. Like me, I can't see them, I guess. I don't know. I'm talking to the best and brightest, um, and I'm in no way biased, but I think writers are the greatest people on earth. Right. Uh, and I have been shocked since I started asking this question, how many folks have incredibly compelling ghost stories? Oh my God. Uh, I know so people. many people. <laughs> this is part of the reason why I say I'm, I'm open to it. Cause I actually feel like all my friends have, that's probably an exaggeration, but many people that I count near and dear feel like they've seen a ghost or have felt a presence also that's another category or just encountered some general kind of wonkiness that goes in that great category of mm -hmm. yeah 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 totally when uh, Hugh Howie was on here uh, which I never get tired of reminding esteemed audience Hugh Howie on here twice oh it was amazing um <laughs> yeah he's one of the more skeptical people you're ever going to hear um very very science focused very facts focused and he uh -huh. had to, yeah I saw a strange light that flew uh that there's a flu but that came under my boat in the middle of the ocean no idea what it was and we just leave it at that so ah well that's a reasonable approach how can you know what that was fair enough yeah I mean, I will say there was one time I saw something. I didn't say this before, Rob, but now, now I'm going to, I'm going to admit it. I did see something one time my husband and I were driving back from Washington DC and we're waiting on the, there's like a big ramp that you're on to go into the Holland tunnel. So you're, it's on, it's raised and it's going down to the ground and then you're going to have the drive to the Holland Tunnel and then go into the tunnel. But when you're on this raised part, you have this beautiful view of Manhattan right over here. And I did feel like I saw something in the sky that I was like, that's not a plane or a helicopter. But I, I doubt myself because there were so many other, I mean, it was packed with cars and nobody else was reacting. Also, my husband was like, ah. So I feel like, no, I don't know. But maybe I did see a flying saucer. <laughs> That's like the, the bulk of flying saucer experiences right. across the world. Is, that was strange. Don't, yeah. don't know that was, they don't stop and say, hey, we're from Zeta Reticula. Nice meeting you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 
I love that question. Though uh, something that drives me nuts is when people make the argument that everybody's walking around with a cell phone or a camera. So if there were flying saucers, wouldn't people have videos of them? And it just drives me nuts because have you been on YouTube? There are so yeah. many videos that uh, by people that don't tell me they're they're doing it for the money. There's no money. They, they yeah, there's no money. Compilations. Um, there are so many compilations of things people have recorded with their phones that just spend spend a day on YouTube, esteemed audience. You know, we'll come out of right. believe. <laughs> right, right. Oh, totally, totally. Plus, as you say, the government is even saying they're not. I don't. They, to my to my understanding, they didn't say what it was. They just were saying there are unidentified flying objects. Un that's what they are. We don't know what they are. And they also indicated that they had a recovered uh, technology program. Uh -huh. Whatever that means. I didn't. I didn't read that. I didn't hear that. Yep. Whoa. The Pentagon has recovered something. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that they've just got bits of asteroids and they couldn't identify them until they landed? I don't right. They didn't right. have photos. It doesn't mean the dashboard <laughs> of, a, of a ship. That's what I think it is. <laughs> well, here's the fuzzy dice that the aliens had on them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, toggle block, the toggle thing they use. <laughs> Their little dashboard Jesus. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> that That's opens exactly the what I'm picturing. <laughs> like the the thing that that Kurt goes like boo -doo, boo -doo, boo -doo, boo -doo, boo -doo, boo on his like chair. You know, uh -huh. he has those buttons. Something like that. Just an alien version. That's what I think it is. <laughs> Makes sense to me. <laughs> uh, pivoting back to a slightly serious note, we'll, we'll end on this. But what you want to talk about something serious? What? Oh, serious. <laughs> <laughs> all right, hit me. What is it? For all those uh, writers out there who are watching or listening to us now, if you could impart one or two or three, however many bits of wisdom that you like, um, that might make easier their path uh, that you've told your clients over the years, what would you want them to hear? Huh. Okay. Well, I love this question. Um, and I've been thinking about it all day. Um, and I also, um, checked in with my colleagues to see what they had to say. Um, and so I got a couple of different responses. Um, the first was, um, don't let any mean people make you cry. <laughs> I think that's great advice. Um, the second was, be patient, have patience. Um, it's not, it's, it's entirely necessary in publishing. Everything takes time and it takes more time than you want it to take. And then you will be in a giant rush um, because then your editor will suddenly show up and say, oh my God, okay, here it is. And I need this back in a week. Can you do that? Um, so just pace yourself and recognize that being patient is um, a key, truly a key, a key skill. Um, so that's what a couple of colleagues of mine said. When I was thinking about this, um, Rob, I was thinking about, because um, of the note you sent, what is the advice? I think you said, what is the advice if you could go back and give yourself um, at any point in your career? So I'm not a writer, but I think this still applies. Um, the thing that I wish I had known sooner, maybe, um, is that, um, to, to cultivate my inner, um, my inner voice, my inner sense of what's exciting to me when I'm reading and, 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 and what I'm just really thrilled about. Um, and not to try, put, this is part of it, but it's not the main part of it, but not to try to worry about what would so-and-so think about this? What would so-and-so think about this? N not to try to guess that. That's part of what's necessary, but there's also just allowing yourself to really hear, it's it, hear your gut, your gut instinct, and let that, I think when you're really listening to that, that sense of yourself um, grows more confident and you can hear, hear that, that inner voice, that inner arbiter better. And um, at the end of the day, I think as a writer, um, what you can ultimately really control is, is your writing. And 
having a very clear sense of what you are trying to achieve, the stories you want to write, what who you want to be as a writer, that is up to absolutely nobody but you. And holding on to that and knowing what that is very clearly is um, just going to hold you in really good stead. Um, so that's what my advice would be to cultivate your inner, cultivate your gut, your instincts, and really build on that sense of, of who you are and who you want to be. There you have it. Perfect note to end on. There we are. <laughs> we come full circle. We crushed it. Where can uh, find you on online? Find you on social media and all that good stuff. Oh, wait, say that again. Where can people where, find me? Where can we find yeah. you online and on social media? Right. So on Twitter, I'm at Susan Hawk, and on uh, Instagram, I am I'm up at Upstart Crow. Is all of us. Um, Upstart Crow Literary, I think is what it is on Instagram. And our website too has a ton of information. Um, so look for me in all those good places. And as always, esteemed audience, um, for more interviews, including uh, a written interview with, I think, year one uh, of Susan Hawk as a literary yeah. back in, in 2011, uh, you faced the seven questions, uh, as well as, uh, in fact, you know what, real quick digression, just looking at those earlier in preparation, it was like a, a bit of a time machine. Yeah. In 2011, you mentioned favorite TV shows uh, made me laugh because you were talking about um, you just finished watching Battlestar Galactica uh, and you began it. Mad Men and you're thinking about uh, the uncut version of Downton Abbey. I'm like, yes, I remember all of that. What a glorious time. For I know. That's so <laughs> funny. That, that is the particular thing that you mentioned, Rob, because I was thinking today about the fact that I, I always remember doing that Q and A with you because you asked about favorite TV shows. Because not a lot of people at that point, you know, I when you do these online interviews, not a people had not a lot of people had asked me that question. And I think it is a really good way to uh, help understand someone's taste. Um, so good question, good question, Rob. Well, heck, let's uh, update it for the modern age. How what, what are your favorite TV shows now? What are you watching? Well, let's see. Um, Right now, something that I'm watching and loving is Hacks um, on HBO. Really funny. Um, I am watching, I'm also watching Flight Attendant. I think that's what it's called. It's also on HBO. Um, sort of a thriller, um, fun. Those are both very, sometimes something I'm watching feel like, it, even if not, uh, even if not, directly translatable to what a potential kids book project might be. Um, it, it's sort of like, it could be something. Um, both of those are very adult, I think. But um, um, I also just finished watching with my husband Severance. Um, did you did you watch Severance? Yes, my wife and I watched it together. Yeah, that is show. a There's the really show good watches, The show was I watch and that was, that was an us show. Yeah, exactly. That that was that's an us and over me too. Um, did you guys like it? We loved it. Yeah, it's great. It's great. And another crossover show my husband and I are now watching because we finished Severance. We are watching Barry. Mm, yes. Are you? Have you watched that? I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm caught up to. I think we're right in the middle of season three, so I'm like two uh -huh. episodes behind. Uh huh. I think Barry is an absolutely amazing show. Like the combination of character development, emotional beats, drop dead, excellent plotting. I, I think it's like, I want every, every writer to watch it because I think it is really, I mean, it's a TV show, it's for adults, it's, you know, but I, I think it's a, like a masterclass. I love Barry. I really think it's amazing. What compels me about, uh, lots of things compel me about that show. But one thing that compels me is none of the characters are likable. They're all no. despicable and Barry is the worst. And yet- <laughs> Barry's a, yeah, terrible. Yeah, but you just love them. You just love them. Or, or I do at any rate. I mean, I, or let's just say I care about all of them. Um, even though they're they're terrible. That's a great, I love that show. 
I feel like part of it is just because everyone is so terrible, it makes you a little bit more forgiving of Barry. <laughs> right. It's true. He's he's in really good company. Um, yeah, that's a great, that's a great show. Um, yeah, what else, what else are you watching that you're loving? Oh, well, as of this moment, I am on season two of The Handmaid's Tale. I uh, watched the first season forever ago and I had read the book and I thought, okay, that's a wonderful version of the book and they're going to keep going and that's great. But I know that this is just going to get darker and grimmer. So I'm out. And then the, as we're recording this, this this will be old news by the time a steamed audience hears us. But there was that recent leak that uh, the the Supreme Court is going to do away with Roe v. Wade. I'm like, okay, well, never mind. We're going to live in Gilead. I better watch, take notes this time. (laughs) Let me find out what our future is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that's interesting that you say that about it getting so dark. I read I read Handmaid's Tale a long time ago, and then and then reread it shortly before uh, the TV show happened. I didn't know um, that the TV show was happening. I just I don't know. I was like, oh, I want to read this book again. And um, so the show is pretty fresh in my mind when I watched the first season. I think it's an amazing show, and I watched the second season, and I think I didn't do. I can't. I stopped watching. I don't know if I stopped watching it after second or third. I can't remember, but I did feel like I just, uh, it just got too dark for me. I got, it just got too dark, but that's an amazing, it's so interesting to me because they really take the book and go much farther um, because the book is, you know, the, the show is just much bigger in terms of story and characters than the book is. It's really interesting to see how they built on, on what was there. That was fascinating. I'm curious. To, I mean, like I say, I'm uh, three, as we record this, I'm three episodes away from the end of season two. But I'm, I know Bradley Whitford's coming, so I'm going to stick with it. Um, but um, what my initial um uh, hesitance to watch this. I know it's a Gilligan's Island type of situation where if Offred ever, June Offred ever gets free, the show's over. So she's always going to be there in some capacity, which yeah. means they will have to get darker and meaner as the show escalates just to escalate the which, yeah, which you talk- hesitance. Yeah, you but totally now that, that uh, the world has gotten darker and scarier, I'm like, oh, what the heck? Let's. <laughs> <laughs> <Right, exactly. laughs> <laughs> why not yeah 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 right no there's a point i can't remember where it is but it was at the end the last one i watched was at the very last episode of whatever that season was that i watched and june offred made the decision to stay it was like there were there she had options and she took the option to stay and i was like but what <laughs> And, and as you say, right, because there's no show if she doesn't stay. So has to be. Oh, I know. Season three, she gets away and then there's a reason to come back. There'll, there'll be something. Right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Which is why, at what I think wisely, when she did the Testaments, which I've been enjoying, I, I just recently listened to, um, it's about other characters who aren't offered. So it's not a sequel. Yeah, I didn't. I haven't read that. I'm curious about that. Did you enjoy it? You listened to it? I mean, enjoy, I think is the wrong word, but I definitely right. appreciated and respected the craft that, that went into it. Mm-hmm, and yes, mm-hmm. I listened to it and it's got a, I think Ann Dowd is the, plays Aunt Lydia. So it's Aunt Lydia from the show playing Aunt I Lydia. I love her. Oh, what an awesome call that was for the audio book. That's great. That's great. Highly recommend it. Plus Margaret Atwood uh, hops in there every so often and she's- Oh, uh, she re- does? Uh-huh. Oh my gosh. I love Margaret Atwood. I was just listening to an interview with her. I can't remember what that podcast was, but it was so great. Um, she's so funny. Um, I hope I'm that smart and together when I'm in my eighties. I um, wish I were that smart and together right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Actually, I agree with that completely. Um, so yeah. Huh. Well, it's so fun talking with you. 
It was. We will have to do this again sometime, if not on the show, but by God in person. Now I would that, love uh, to do back that. Stated here at uh, Casa de Kent, I'm getting back out to conferences, so hopefully I'll see you and I'll buy you. Yeah, a yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. I just got a conference invitation um, this week. Um, somebody asking, you know, to come if I would come be a speaker, and I was like, oh yay! I love. Com- I mean. You can't, I can't do too many, you know, you could get worn down with doing too many of them. So, um, but I love being in person with people and talking about books. Oof, it's the best. Not, um, I always feel like going to a conference as a literary agent, as opposed to an author is like being the only human in a zombie movie. <laughs> <laughs> is that worrisome with all those authors? Around? Well, I'll tell you this. <laughs> it is a boost to the ego. Let's just say um, <laughs> whenever I come back from my conference, my husband is always like, oh, conference Susan is home. She's a big deal, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a, a dangerously inflated uh, idea. Of your yeah, it's like, um, if you'd like to know my opinion, I'd be happy to share it with you <laughs> <laughs> because my opinion matters a lot um yeah no it's it's good to go I mean I I genuinely I mean I I like talking with people and being with people that's really fun but I also feel like you know I I learn there's amazing writers there talking about craft and I learn from that too you know um oh L'Oreal Sanderson does this I'll suggest that to my clients you know I mean really it's it's an opportunity, I think, for me too, not just for the writers. So, well, so. I, oh, the what? Audio, it came back. Oh, I I I didn't know it went away. <laughs> I just oh. briefly. Uh, I don't know, Steve. Audio's God willing and alive. I'll see you next week. Thank you, Susan Hawk, for a tremendous show. Um, and that's the end. Woo. Okay, cool. <laughs>